Greetings. The Lord is with you. I'm Pastor Bob Quaintance, pastor of Good Hope Lutheran Church in Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, uh, I am, as you can see, I'm back home right now, not in the office this evening. <coughs> I was able to join my family for dinner because it's one of my grandsons, Alex's sixth birthday today. It was also his last day of school, and you could say a little prayer for Alex because he came home early, quite sick with a temperature, and he hasn't really been eating his uh, his dinner, so we'll have to see if he's up to eating anything for cake. And he wanted, like, chocolate by death, so he's got chocolate cake and chocolate icing and chocolate ice cream. But we're not sure for that little boy if, if uh, he's feeling up to it. I see uh, uh, Peggy's on, and... Uh, Fred is on, and by the way, Fred, congratulations on your new grandson, Ramon. I saw a picture of him uh, just maybe a half an hour or so ago. Nina showed me something that Patty had sent. So congratulations on the new grandchild and looking forward to uh, meeting uh, Ramon and uh, his, his seeing his parents and how happy they all are. And, and uh, so, uh, but enough of those things. We're going to begin tonight uh, with the sign of the cross. As together we say, we are under the care of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll open with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy that you give to us in life, celebrating birthdays and celebrating births. We pray your blessing on little Ramon, and we pray, Lord, your healing to be with young Alex, um, that... Uh, both of them may travel this day and the days to come with your blessing and with health and growth. Uh, Lord, help us to, uh, as we encounter your word today, to receive the blessing you intend for us as you seek to grow us in Christ. Um, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining with me. Hi, Susie. Uh, glad to see that you're on as well. And uh, uh, last night... Uh, we had worship, and uh, the rain didn't come till well after worship. Um, and uh, uh, we were on the text for Holy Trinity. I am still thinking about on Wednesday nights whether I'm going to stick with the Sunday text or stick with the, uh, the Wednesday night text because after worship was over, then I had to get back in my office and, oh, about 8.30 or so, uh, went into uh, the teaching, uh, the devotion for the evening. I'm just not sure if I want to do that or do what I did at Lent and make the devotion on Wednesday be the text that we're reading. So we'll, uh, I'm still, I need to pray about that. Um, and so uh, I will do so. But we, we began uh, the book of Ephesians yesterday uh, with uh, uh, two things uh, in chapter one. First, Paul talking about all the blessings we have in Christ. He listed seven. We're chosen, adopted, we're redeemed, which also means we're forgiven. We, um, um, uh, God has, has in Christ united all things in him. Uh, and uh, then uh, number five, we have, uh, um, we have this amazing inheritance. Number six, we have heard the word of truth, the gospel, and believed. Uh, both the gospel message and faith are gifts from God. And then number seven, we have received the Holy Spirit as a down payment on all that God has yet to give us. That was the first thing, just an announcement of what spiritual blessings we've received in Christ. And then Paul had his uh, amazing prayer, uh, a mega prayer, um, not just a prayer, Lord, please heal Alex uh, so he feels better on his birthday, can have his chocolate cake he's been talking about for a week. Um, but a, a much more expansive prayer um, that God would help you to know him, uh, really know him personally. Good evening, Shirley. That you might know the hope you have, the inheritance you have, and the power that is at work in you, the power that raised God from the dead, or raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places. Well, that's yesterday. Uh, but but I, I should have read verse 10. It's kind of the theme of the letter of Ephesians. Um, and it was the fourth of the blessings. Um, a, a mystery made known in Christ. Uh, a plan for the fullness of time. When Christ came, a plan for the right moment. 
that God would unite all things in him. We're going to explore that theme of unity more in the gospel. But tonight in chapter 2, we're going to talk about what Christ has done for us and is doing in our lives. Um, these are the first three chapters of Ephesians, the theological time, and the last three chapters are the life application part. And so here's what we have to learn about what Christ has done for us. Amongst those spiritual uh, blessings that were listed, those seven listed in the, uh, uh, the beginning of, of chapter one, here he talks about it in a, in a way speaking into our lives. And, and he's first talking with everyone. Then he's going to talk with the Gentiles. And then he's going to talk to, all, again, all believers. He says for all people, because this is Paul's truth about the human condition. You, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the, tres in the trespasses and sins in which, you, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Um, he's going to talk about that again, about being dead. But if we're talking about what Christ has done for us and what it, how, how it is we come to faith, uh, good evening, Shirley. Um, we don't contribute anything to coming to faith. This is... This is hard to understand. I know in American Christianity, not, not true everywhere else in the world, there has developed a, a sense of what you have to do and you have to personally believe. And while, while faith is absolutely essential, what the Bible says here in verse 2 is absolutely true. In sin, you were dead. People talk about free will. God gives us a free will, and so we can choose to believe in Christ or choose not to believe in Christ. This is not Paul's teaching. Um, what Paul teaches, and of course we do have a free will in some ways. I get to decide whether to brush my teeth or not. Uh, I get to decide if I want cereal or eggs in the morning or skip breakfast and get a cup of coffee at McDonald's. I, I, I get to decide what color shirt I'm wearing. Um, where I'm going to do my devotion. Um, all those things perfectly within my sphere of free choice. But I am not free to choose God. Paul talked about this in Romans 7. The good I want to do, I do not do. The very evil I hate is what I end up doing. There's no freedom there. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Well, here Paul makes it clear in chapter 2, verse 1. Can't be said any clearer. You were dead. Dead bodies can't do anything. Someone has to come and give them life. Like the bodies, the bones, in the valley of dry bones. God has to act or they're dead and will remain so. This is, this is the word of God. And I, I think it's the truth. That doesn't mean faith isn't a part to play. And it absolutely is. Paul's going to talk about that here in chapter 2. But you were dead. Dead bodies don't contribute anything to their new life and salvation. You were dead, uh, and this is true of all people in the world. Paul talked about that all, in Romans. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. When we lived our lives the way we wanted to, before knowing Christ, whether Jews or Gentiles, we were following the course of this world. I think sometimes young people who are raised as children in the church struggle with relationships with friends who seem to go a different way and they're, they're directing him to, directing your son or daughter into choices that are, are not healthy. Um, in that case, then they're tempted to follow the course of the world, in which case they are following the prince of the power of the air. Uh, the devil, uh, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you, we all, Jews and Gentiles, in, in, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. 
uh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, or by nature, uh, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. By nature, we are dead in our sins, and we have a fallen nature. We may say, I have a free will. We have a broken will. We have a fallen will. Um, we can decide to do some good things, but we cannot decide to be good. We can decide to try and search for God, but but even that desire is not natural to our fallen nature. Uh, it is a gift of God. To we who were dead, all of us, Paul says, we all once lived in this way, verse 3. But verse 4, God intercedes into our life situation. And as we as Christians are living our life, we sometimes, and we're going to hear this later in Ephesians, where we're called to put off the old sinful nature and put on Christ, like changing old dirty laundry and putting on fresh, clean clothes. Um, we, we need to think about how God is calling us to live. And in that battle with sin, we don't stand much of a chance if we fight it just in our mind. We're going to need the Spirit to help us. And this battle is a battle with spiritual forces, Paul says in, in uh, Ephesians 6. Well, we have this wonderful phrase in verse 4, but God. We were dead. There was no hope. But God, you say those two words, and there is hope in any area of life. Do you believe that? I was saying amen. But God, being rich in mercy, undeserved grace of God, um, unmerited favor. Um, in grace, we get what we don't deserve. In mercy, we don't get what we do deserve. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Um, we were dead. But God cared for us. Because he is rich in mercy. And he showed us great love. And what he did was he made us alive. You were dead, but God has made us alive together with Christ. I said yesterday, and we'll see it throughout this reading and, and throughout the book of Ephesians, one of the <coughs> most often used phrases in the book of Ephesians is the phrase, in Christ, or in Jesus, or in Christ Jesus. So the way I've understood that phrase, I think it was from... <clears throat> C.S. Lewis, first, that I, I have uh, um, my reading list for uh, uh, this 5x5 five five reading plan. And so, um, to be in Christ, uh, he used the idea of a book. I don't really have a book other than my Bible. Um, I guess I could use my Bible because this piece of paper is falling apart. I have to get some tape. But here's my Bible. I'm going to stick a... Oh, no, I just used my... my, my uh, for a bookmark, I'll, I'll use my uh, dollar bill. Um, what what will happen to this dollar bill? Well, it's dead. It's lifeless. But Christ is alive, and God puts me in Christ. And when I am in Christ, whatever happens to Christ happens to the dollar bill because it's in the Bible. If I put this uh, Bible in a fire, this book in a fire, what will happen to the Bible? It'll be burned up. What will happen to the dollar? Whatever happens to the Bible will happen to the do dollar. What if I throw it in the ocean? What will happen to the Bible? It'll get wet. What will happen to the dollar bill? Whatever happens to the Bible will happen to the dollar bill. That's the illustration uh, that C.S. Lewis uses of what it means. Uh, no, it wasn't C.S. Lewis. Excuse me. It was Watchman Nee. Um, 125 years ago or 100, 100 years ago, um, Christian in China, facing persecution in his time. It was he who used that illustration in his classic book on the, uh, on the book of Ephesians. I commend it to you. It's a small little book, uh, as small as you could get, I guess. Uh, I have some copies in my, my office. Sit, Walk, Stand, Watchman Nee's book. Um, he used that illustration of what it means to be in Christ is 
that whatever, whatever happens to the dollar bill, you throw it in a magazine, you throw it in the fire, it sits out and gets wet. Whatever happens to the magazine or book happens to the dollar bill. So to be in Christ, then what happens is that we were dead, just like that dollar bill. But what God did is he put us in Christ. And so when Christ died, Romans 6, we died with him because we were placed in Christ. And when does that happen? I think uh, Paul says in Romans 6 that it happens in our baptism. Um, some people think of that baptism as just a, a show that shows the world uh, what, what we believe. Well, Paul thinks that it's something more than that, that we are connected to Christ in that moment. How? God does it. Uh, he doesn't ask my opinion. He just tells me this is what's happening. And uh, when I'm put in Christ, I'm also died with him on the cross. My sins died on the cross. And when he rose from the dead, I rose to newness of life. And so here again, we are made alive, verse 5, together with Christ. That theme of being in Christ. By grace, unmerited favor, undeserved favor. Uh, by grace, you have been saved and raised up with him. Not only have you been al made alive, but you're in Christ. And where is Christ? He is seated at the right hand of God. So Paul says, because you're in Christ, we were ra he raised us up. By grace, you've been saved. He made us alive together with Christ and raised us up, verse 6, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Um where do we live now? We live in heaven with Christ because Christ lives there. Not only does Christ live there, but he sends his spirit and he lives within us. It's a wonderful, wonderful connection. Um, he seated us with him in the heavenly places of the heavenly realm uh, in Christ Jesus so that in the ages, in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus in the coming ages, uh, beyond the time uh, in the coming years, in the coming ages after we die, in the after this world is disintegrated throughout eternity, God's desire is to send his son to put us in Christ, that he can die on the cross and we die with him. He's raised from the dead, we are raised with him. He ascends into heaven and we ascend with him and we are with Christ and we are with God. Why? So that God can show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. One could circle in the Bible all those times where it says in Christ or with Christ. God desires us to be with him. Why? It's, it's out of his being rich in mercy and out of, out of great love. Then uh, this verse that we all ought to have memorized, verse 8 and 9, and probably verse 10. Uh, verse 8 for sure. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Um, we'll go on to read 9 in a moment. I am saved by grace alone. I am not saved by faith. I am saved through faith. But I am clearly saved by grace, by what God has done. Uh, I, I had a missionary come to our church when I was a young man, maybe junior high, high school. And he told the story about someone coming to ask him if uh, uh, if he could be saved. And he said, it, oh, no, what can I do to be saved? The man said, and, and the missionary said, you're too late. Too late to be saved? Too late to do anything to be saved. It was done 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. And if you believe that, you enter into the family of God. We are saved by grace 2,000 years ago on the cross at Golgotha. By grace, you have been saved. Through faith, it doesn't happen to unbelievers. There are many people who were, who were in the day of Christ and did not believe, and they are not saved. He said, Wide is the road that leads to hell. Narrow and few are the people who take it that lead to heaven. But grace is offered to all. And then those who believe 
that this that what God has done, He has done, that God has done it, uh, and and that they that uh, they believe He has done it for them. Uh, they they'll be saved. It's a wonderful gift, universal in its offer, received by those who believe. Uh, the man who ordained me, uh, I don't know what he did with this verse later on, um, but later in his years, uh, Doctor Bowman, um, uh, he. Uh, he, he fell into universalism. I guess Jesus is stronger than the devil. He'll he'll save everybody. Or the, the the pastor who served our church as an interim before I came, later bishop of Northeast Ohio and currently bishop of the of the ELCA, um, she said that that she thinks there is a hell, but there's nobody in there. Uh, I don't know what she was thinking about saying that it's unfortunate and i i like her so much we've been friendly to each other and she was a great pastor and bishop to me um but we're saved by grace through faith and and even this even your faith is not your own doing not the results of works it is, it is the gift of god for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is a gift of god it is absolutely and completely and unreservedly a death a, a, a gift because you were dead and there was nothing you could do. You couldn't even believe, but God sp spoke the gospel. This is one of those great spiritual blessings that, that Paul writes about in the list of seven, that, um, uh, that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him. Uh, this 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 great gift of of uh, one of seven great gifts mentioned spiritual blessing is that you heard the gospel and you believed this is a gift from God it is not the result of works so that no one can boast you can't make your belief yourself believe something um, it's something that happens inside your heart how do you explain that the Holy Spirit has called me in the gospel he, he draws me into faith um, so verse 9 this is not the results of works um, so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them this is just so powerful I'm not saved by my works I am not saved by my faith I'm saved by grace through faith uh, for Luther, he was he was always trapped by his works. He thought he had to do something to earn. In my early years, um, uh, after having a renewal of faith, I would go to places and feel like I needed to keep recommitting myself to God. Can't tell you how many times I did that. Um, actually, at that point, what I was trying to trust in was was my trust, and my trust was never good enough, never complete. And so, I, as I struggled with trusting God more fully, I kept wanting to trust Him more fully and think I had to do something. No, I'm not saved by my trusting, by my imperfect Bob trusting. I'm saved by God's grace. Through faith, and faith is trusting that He is good enough. My, I will never be. I, I, I'm just dead. But God has been rich in mercy and with great love sent Jesus well, that's, that's what I came to believe. And when I finally came to believe that, I relaxed. Didn't have to go forward anymore. Didn't have to do anything. Just relaxed. Uh, God is good. Saved by grace through faith. But that's not the end of the story. Created for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're not saved by our works, but God intends us to do good works. He intends us to change you, not to just leave you the poor sinner that you are, but to change you so that in those works, uh, you will be working the work that God desires you to do. Living, thinking, acting, talking the way God desires to live, think, act, and talk. Part two of, of this. So that was about all Christians. Now he's going to talk to the Gentiles for just a uh, four verses or 
3 verses, 11 through 13. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made uh, in the flesh by hands, not the heart. Um, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Now, all of us were dead, but Gentiles before coming to faith in Christ, you were also separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Um, not only were you dead in your trespasses, but you were separated from all the hope that could, you could give to you, that God could give to you. You were really in trouble as Gentiles. But now in Christ Jesus, that, that dollar bill placed back in the book, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ forgives everyone, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male or female, makes no difference. We are all one in Christ, as, as we'll find out. Now, speaking again to all Christians, Jews and Gentiles, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both Jew and circumcised and uncircumcised, made us both one, that theme of unity, God, God has come to unite all things in Christ. He has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jesus has his arm around a Jew and his other arm around a Gentile, and he's hugging them both. We're both equally accepted before him. He abolishes the law and commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, who are saved not by their works or obedience, but saved simply by faith, like the faith of Abraham, back to the beginning, that he might um, uh, create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making shalom, peace, um, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Isn't that a wonderful word, phrase uh, to say uh, he has killed uh, hostility? Hostility leads to death. Jesus has killed hostility. <laughs> wonderful. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, to the circum uncircumcised, and peace to those who are near, <laughs> to, the, to the circumcised. It uh, doesn't matter. He makes, treats us one. He offers his shalom, his absolute undisturbedness. Like he was asleep in the boat when the disciples were afraid. You can have that gift, Gentiles and Jews, everyone, because he comes speaking peace. Preach peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So what has happened in our lives in Christ? What has, what has God done? Well, he, we were dead and he made us alive. We're saved by grace through faith for works. Uh, he'll talk more about that in the second half. And, and we're no longer at odds, at enmity. We are at peace with one another. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow heir, fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God, part of his family. And this household of God is, verse 29, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, um, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. If any house is built, that's the house uh, we ought to have, uh, the house uh, uh, that is built by Jesus, uh, shaped by Jesus, conformed to Jesus, that he is the cornerstone. In whom, in Christ, verse 21, I think I said 29, it must have been 20. All my lines through here, uh, uh, blurring the words, or blurring the numbers. Uh, in whom the whole structure, the house, is being joined together and grows up into a holy temple in the Lord. It's just not any house. But together, we are being shaped together by Christ into a dwelling place, a temple for God. Not only are we part of the household of God, part of the family of God, 
we are now part of the temple of God and he will dwell within the community of faith. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. We grow together into a holy temple where the world can watch us, as Jesus says, love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are truly my disciples if you love one another. The call of the church is to love God and love one another. What does it mean to love? Well, what do you think it means? Find someone in need. Jesus told the parable, Good Samaritan. You come across a person in need, you meet that need. You be loving, especially to the household of faith. We grow into the temple in the Lord. Again, in him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In Christ, we are placed in him, in Christ. We are a dwelling being built. It's a process. Um, as a congregation, as an individual, as the church universal, it's a process that's ongoing, but we are being built into a dwelling place by God, by the Spirit. I remember, just I'll close with this. Years ago, while the great temples in Europe were being built and they take two centuries or a century and a half to build, um, someone was walking around and asking different people, carpenters, and, and masons and, and, and artisans, uh, painters and stained glass workers, uh, what their job was. And they would explain the particular part of the building uh, process that they were working on. And he came across, uh, as he was leaving, a little old uh, woman sweeping uh, the dust away. And asked her what she was doing as part of the building of the, and, and she said, I'm building a temple for God her little part. She's the one who knew what she was doing. Uh, we are built, being built into a dwelling place in God. Why do we exist? To know God and to make him known. To allow God to live in us and through us to speak to the world. Well, that's our end for today. I'd like to close with a little prayer. Thanks all for joining me. Heavenly Father, thank you that in Christ we have been made alive. By your great mercy, and great love. Thank you that your grace has saved us and that you have brought us to faith. Lord, you intend our lives for good works. You created us by to, to, to be by your by your workmanship. You're building us. Um, we're not building you a temple. You are building us into a temple where Christ is living in our own individual lives, but especially in our life together. So we pray, Lord, for good hope and all the congregations and for the North American Lutheran Church and the Church Universal. We pray, Lord, that we might, in faithfulness to you, live in Christ and for Christ in mission to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope that others can see Christ in you and that God can see Christ in us together. Thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, tomorrow's Friday day off, probably on around about seven. But if I'm doing something with my wife um, for our day off, then and I, uh, then I'm going to take time to do that, and I'll be on it some other time during the day. Uh, that's always uh, I've changed to do it on Fridays. But uh, God bless you tonight, and go in peace. And remember, God loves you, and, and so do I. Bye bye.